Uh, we should have hung around in church longer than what we did. I got, we went down and ate lunch, and um, I came back up. I don't know exactly what time it was, but I, I pulled up my email, and I saw an email from Ariel, one of our followers out in Phoenix. By the way, if you think it's hot out here, it is blistering in Phoenix right now, about 110, 115 degrees, something like that. But anyway, she said, in an email, said, Pastor Mike, you left the cameras on. And I checked, and sure enough, we were streaming the sanctuary. It was like 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the afternoon. We were streaming. I thought, man, we should have stayed up in church for that. You know, we're going to have to pay for it. It's only $5 an hour, so it ain't a big deal. But, you know, we, we should have stayed up here for church. So we, And you know what I think? I think some people were just sitting there watching. <laughs> Wait for something to happen. Maybe they'll come back. Okay. So anyway, Matthew chapter 24. Are you there? Say amen. Uh, I don't know where to... You know what? Let's go to... Um, let's go to verse 19. And I'm just going to move our way down here. But pray, uh, verse 19, Woe to them that are with child, to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. Now, just very quickly, you've heard a lot of things probably in your lifetime about... What is called the tribulation. What I'd like for you to do. On, you can do it on your own time. I may do. I know I've talked about it on Pastor Mike online before. Uh, I've talked about it many times. But just do your own study of the word. Tribulation. Tribulations. It comes in two forms in your Bible. Do your own study. Uh, punch that in to the pure Bible search software. And read every verse. When you get to a verse. Open it up and just kind of look around that verse to see what's being said. And study that. Alright? Um, to be honest, I have not found any indication that a time of tribulation lasts seven years. I have not found that in the Bible. And I know that's, that may rub some people the wrong way. I know that probably goes against the grain. Maybe I'm just blind and don't see it. Okay, but I've not found the scriptures that, that say that. I, to me, I look for it to be plain. If it's important, God makes it plain as day. Okay, and uh, I've just not seen that. So, but anyway, he mentions that for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. Do your study of the elect. Who are the elect in the Bible? Okay, verse 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it. Not, for there shall arise false Christs, plural, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Here's the good news. If you are the elect of God, it is not possible to deceive you. If you are God's elect, God will not allow you to be deceived by these false Christs and these false prophets. Okay? And he uses the word very elect. Some want to make that into like grades and levels of those who are elect. That is not what it means. The word very comes from a Latin word veritas. Means true. When Jesus said verily, verily I say unto you, what was he saying? Truly, truly I say unto thee. The word very elect means true. You are truly elect. You're not one of the false apostles, false brethren, false converts. You're not one of the false church pew people who pretend to be Christian, but they're not really saved. They're not really born again. Okay, That's what very elect means. And if that's you... Here's what I'll tell you to do. In fact, God will lead you into it. Study the Bible. Know some things about this Bible. Let God Ask God to lead you to know things about this Bible. I purposed in my heart years ago that I wanted to know this Bible. 
I don't think I've attained to it. If I did, I would go on a sabbatical. I'd go on vacation and say, okay, I got it all. I'm out of here. I don't have it all down. I don't know it all. I'm still studying. But I believe that at this time, God's elect will not be deceived. Don't worry. If you're really saved, God's going to keep you from that. Meanwhile, the fake church pew people are going to be deceived. They're going to be part of a falling away. God is going to send them a strong delusion and they are going to believe a lie or the lie, whatever it is, all right? So verse 25, he said, Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. My ancestors are buried in Marcus Hill Cemetery, in, uh, at near, right next to Marcus Hill Baptist Church near Enola, Arkansas. And every one of their graves are facing east. Okay? Why? Because that's, I mean, there's no, there's nothing in the Bible that says if you're not facing east in the grave, you're not going to go. Okay? It doesn't say that. But it's, it's, it was one of those traditional things that our forefathers did that when they buried their, their loved ones as Christian people, they buried them facing the direction that Jesus is going to come in the resurrection. Okay? Because the idea was they want to be facing Jesus, not turned away from him. That's not bad, amen? Not bad. So whoever, if you're still around when I go, when you bury me, bury me facing east. Okay? I don't want to have my back turned on Jesus. Amen? Where's the amens in this place tonight? Who are you people anyway? Huh? They left? The amens didn't, the amens didn't leave, I guarantee you that. Anyway. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. There's many scriptures that, talk, that touch on that. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. What is the sign of the Son of Man? What's going to be that sign? Is it like the peace sign? Is he going to be doing this? No. Thumbs up? What is his sign? Huh? Huh, John? In the clouds. That's what it says. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. There's your sign, There's your sign right there. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Look at there. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. From one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know it is near, even at the doors. According to Matthew 24, the fig tree is all these things. Okay? The fig tree here is all these things that he said was going to happen. Now you may have heard that the fig tree was... Anybody know? What's the common teaching or idea on this, who this fig tree is or what this fig tree is? Anybody know? Israel. Okay? It's based upon one verse in the Old Testament where God equated Israel to a fig tree. But in other passages like in Luke and Mark where this teaching is repeated... Jesus not only mentioned fig trees, but he mentioned all other trees. So we're not just dealing with just a fig tree, but he uses the fig tree as an analogy. And he's referring to all these things here in Matthew 24 that's going to happen. And he's saying, when you shall see these things come to pass, get ready. Okay, get ready. So likewise, when you, you shall see all these things, know it is near, even at the doors. Verse 34, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass. Till all these things be fulfilled. Notice that he said this generation. Okay? This generation. How long is a generation? Does anybody know? Caleb. A thousand years. 
Well, used to be. <laughs> Several thousand years ago, it, it was pretty close, used to be. Hundred years? My grandmother, my great grandmother lived to be 101. Okay? I'll ask you this Does the Bible ever say how long a generation is? Not that I found. Never seen it. Okay? I know the book of Psalms talks about 70 years. My dad lived just as long as the Bible says you should be, 70 years. Okay? Then he went to, when he, then he went to glory. But the Bible doesn't actually fix a time on the word generation. Okay? So does it mean something else? I think it does. And I think it has to do with what, what the purpose of the ark. The purpose of the ark. Why did God tell Noah to build an ark? What was, what was he going to do with that ark? Okay? And that's what we're going to study. But think of the word generation. It has the word gene in it. And it literally, if we were just to apply it the way, the simple way the Bible does, a generation is, I'm one generation, my father and mother were a different generation, and my children are a generation below me. My grandchildren are a generation below them. They're two generations below me. The word generation literally means to generate offspring. Okay? And it, it has in its depth, in its core meaning, genetics, DNA. I'll just tell you, I believe with all my heart that mankind is on a course to alter the DNA that God gave him in Adam. How many of you believe that? That's everywhere. You are, you are in the generation of people who are going to see scientists remake human beings. Take them with the DNA that they inherited from Adam and take that DNA and apply their hands to it and rewrite it and rebuild it and remake human beings with the hands of men instead of the way God wrote their DNA out. The same thing is for the scholars and the really, really people who think they're really smart, take this Bible, take things out, put things in, rewrite things that are in it because they don't like it, because they think it's an error, because it doesn't agree with what they, their outcomes or whatever. Same thing with humans, or the same thing with mosquitoes. Alicia, first time, no, not the first time she went to Kenya. First time she went to Kenya with us. First time she went, first time she went to Kenya, she got malaria. Or is it malaria? more like malaria, isn't it? Yeah. Miss Malaria, okay? Ends up in a Kenyan hospital for a few days. Sick. Well, now they're taking the mosquitoes and they're rewriting their DNA so that they don't pass on the malaria germ or the mosquito kills the malaria germ or whatever, but they're rewriting the mosquito's DNA I think in some cases they're writing the mosquito's DNA so that when it's born, it doesn't recreate itself. It just dies and that's it. They all die off. I think that's a bad idea. I think man plays God with God's word, God's DNA. I think man plays God with that and man doesn't know enough about what he's doing to do it. Amen? But I absolutely think that mankind is going to have his DNA changed. And this generation, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Think about that, okay? Heaven and earth, oh, verse 35, one of my favorite verses. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my original manuscript shall not pass away. Does not say that, does it? My words plural, shall not pass away. And notice, it's in, right in the context of this generation shall not pass. Isn't that cool? Listen, 
God's word that he wrote, that he put in us, it's not going to change. It's not going to pass away till heaven and earth pass away. Amen? Now verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So he said it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah. Now last week, uh, turn to Genesis 6. And uh, last week, let me go back here. We were talking about the various uh, places in history that have a flood story similar to the story in your Bible. The story in your Bible is the correct version. The other stories are the fossilized remains of what really happened. In other words, there's pieces missing, names got changed, uh, it's not God destroying the earth, it's the gods that are doing it and so on. But the core idea is still the same. Every civilization on this planet, there's stories told that the world, the earth, was destroyed with a flood. And yet God saved some people through it. And God saved some animals through it. God saved grain through it, one of the stories told. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me uh, that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, according to what Jesus said, we're going to enter into a time where the imagination of the thoughts of man, lost people, will only be evil continually. How much longer do you think, where we are now, how much longer do you think is that going to take? Shoot, it could be another five hours from now. The way things are going, lost people right now, they're very lost. They don't have a respect. Caleb, how many beer cans and liquor bottles did you pick up, you and JR pick up, from the church, what you told me the other day. You got them at Alicia's house? Oh, you picked them up from there down to Alicia. Oh, okay. That's, let's straighten that up here. We're on live on camera, okay? You didn't find them under Alicia's porch, did you? No. But you know what that means. And I've been seeing this for years. People think it's funny. To throw their, you found a liquor bottle, vodka bottle, something like that? I asked him if there was anything in it. He said, not anymore. <laughs> people don't think, people think it's funny to throw their beer cans and liquor bottles in the church yard. That was unheard of a couple generations ago. You could be lost, but you didn't throw your empty beer cans and soda and beer bottles in the church lawn. I've seen them bust beer bottles up against the church sign before. Okay? We had a big stain, beer stain, running down the face of the church sign years ago. Somebody busted their old beer bottle up against it, thought it was funny. People are very, very, very lost today, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I'll just tell you this. Media has a lot to do with that. People are being bombarded almost constantly with images, sounds, voices, words, pictures, depictions, you name it. People are being, their mind is being bombarded and flooded with every evil thing, every evil imagination that there is. 
and it's not getting any better. It's getting far. Children, when they can put Miley Cyrus on a children's program, and with her doing what she does on stage, that was done deliberate. There is an attempt by evil people to destroy the minds of little children. That's sick. That is warped. Amen. Makes me angry. But anyway, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming son of the man. And we are entering into that time once again. And as, it, as bad as it is right now, I, how much worse can it get? It's going to get a lot worse. So anyway, now look at verse 9. Genesis chapter 6. These are the generations of Noah. Remember what that word generation... Now, he's not, God's not given a time here. He's not saying these are the time frames of the generations. He's saying these are the generations of Noah. The generations of Noah were, in verse 10, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That was his generations... And then in Genesis 10, you have the generations of Shem listed, the generations of uh, Japheth listed, the generations of Ham listed. It's not dates, it's not times, it's not length of years. It's bloodlines, DNA bloodlines, genetics, genetic lines, and so on. All right? Uh, let me give you this. I'll show you how simple this is. Three sons... Of Noah coming off the ark to procreate everybody that's on the face of the earth. Incidentally, but not accidentally, you have three primary races of people. Primary races Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid. Each of those races of men descended from the three sons of Noah. The three sons of Noah probably were very unique and different in their genetic structure. Japheth looked like one group of people. Uh, Shem looked like another group of people. Ham looked like another group of people. Michael's, just, I talked to Michael. I said, Michael, how, where, where do you see your lineage coming from? And he said, Ham. He said, my people are, from, and he told me, he said, that's what we, that's what we were taught. That's what we you know, grew up knowing was that we descended from Egypt through Ham. And he knows it. So his generation is a Hamite generation. I think probably we're Japheth, okay, the Europeans, and Shem is those of the Middle East and into the Far East, okay? Three primary races, three sons of Ham. Have you ever thought about that before? Okay? And basically every human being on the planet is either of a, I don't know that there is any more, a pure descendancy, a pure line. There might be. But every human being on the planet is from one or a combination of those three primary races. Okay? Um, I like to study things like this because I, I think it shows you the truth of the Bible. If you read Genesis 10, you can see those those races of people, all right? So these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. And I want you to notice first night, it says it was perfect in his generations. It does not say that Noah was perfect. It does not say that Noah was more righteous than anybody else. It does not say that Noah's deeds were better than everybody else's deeds. It says nothing about Noah's character. But it talks about Noah's generations. The genetics, the DNA that he handed down to his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay? And that's important. And Noah walked with God. Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted His way upon the earth. Now, I used to look at this and think that all flesh was a reference to 
Every animal, every human being, every fish, every dog, every cat, every cheetah, lion, lizard, things like that. I'm not so sure that that's the case. I may be wrong, but I'm not so sure that that's the case. I think that all flesh here corrupted his way upon the earth is a reference to all mankind. Because it says his way. And that just kind of leads me to believe that it's referencing mankind. Let me tell you the big picture of why I think that. Okay? Let's say that Phil. How you doing, Phil? Let's say that Phil, he's been reading a lot of comic books and watching the Avengers. And he plays a lot of video games. And let's say that uh, five years from now, they can change people's genetics and get rid of cancer and can get rid of glaucoma and can get rid of Alzheimer's. And they can make people like Phil leap over tall buildings with a single bound. And he wants to be a superhero. Spider-Man. There's a new Spider-Man movie coming out. And his genetics are altered. Okay? Uh, the Hulk. His DNA is altered. Captain America. His DNA is altered. Keep going. With all these superheroes. It all is their DNA has been altered. And now they have these superpowers. So Phil wants to leap tall buildings with a single bound. He wants to be faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. So they tell Phil, Phil, we can alter your DNA. You'll have the strength of an elephant. You'll be able to leap like a kangaroo. You'll be faster than a cheetah. We can do all this stuff, and we can make you that. And so Phil says, bring it on. I want it. That's not going to happen, is it, Phil? No. See, Phil's made a choice, like the rest of us. I've already decided that no matter what disease I have, my wife has, my family has, we're going to die with the same DNA God gave us. Okay? So all flesh had corrupted his way. We're living right now in the time when there are people who are already making decisions and telling the doctors, go ahead and change my DNA. That is corrupting his genes. It is corrupting his flesh from the way God intended for it to be. Does that make sense to everybody? All flesh had corrupted his way. It implies here that it was a choice that man made. And he was somehow given the ability to follow through with it. So all flesh had corrupted his way. So at this time... From what I can see in the Bible, all of mankind had been corrupted in their genetics, except who? Noah. Noah was perfect in his generations. He made the choice not to corrupt the way that God had made him. Okay? So, verse 13, God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And so I think mankind has been corrupted. The genetics of mankind throughout humanity has been corrupted. And there are only eight people who have not corrupted their way. Noah, his wife, Noah's sons, and their wives. They had not corrupted their way, their DNA, their genetics, their generations. All right? Um, remember last week what I said, that the devil is, I think, covering this up. Okay? And it wasn't Ryan that sent that to me. It was... Now I already forgot who it was. That's my week. That's how I run. I sampled three of the modern versions of the Bible. The NIV. 
And what I sampled was verse 9. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. The NIV says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. But it doesn't say anything about his generations. The Holman Christian Standard Bible. These are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God. But it doesn't say anything about his generations. The New American Standard Bible, which everybody says, oh, that's the most literal to the Hebrew. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. It mentions his generations, but when it comes to that word generations, it only mentions that it's a record of his generation, but it doesn't mention that his generations were perfect. It doesn't say that. They've altered the text in at least three of the modern translations of the Bible. The King James is the only one that I've found so far that says perfect in his generations. Now, there might be others, but I haven't sampled all of them. All right? Now, the question is, was God interested in making sure that the genetic condition of every living thing remain as he created it? Was that what God was interested in? Why was God destroying the earth? It was twofold. Number one, the thoughts of man was evil. And number two, all flesh had corrupted his way. That's why God, the two reasons why God is destroying everything is because the thoughts of man was only evil continually, meaning that God cannot save them. They've become reprobate. They're beyond saving. And I believe in that. I believe in apostasy. I believe people can fall away and they ain't ever coming back. Okay? It's what I believe. And I believe that in the last days, people are going to cross a line and that's it. Okay? So, Genesis 7 actually tells us the purpose of the ark. God's telling Noah, giving him the instructions. And he says, The fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. What seed? God's seed. The seed, the DNA that God wrote for all of the birds, that God wrote for all of the cows, for all the dogs, the kitty cats, all the living creatures on the planet, God wrote their DNA. God wrote man's DNA. And God wanted to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. He wanted to save and preserve that seed. So that by the time the flood's over with, they come off the ark. All the literal seeds that fell off the trees before the flood, they start to spring up so that the trees that were before the flood are now the trees after the flood. And because all of the land animals had been destroyed in the flood, and I would say a large portion of the fish, because we see fish fossils everywhere too, buried. Todd showed me something that was interesting. He, on the farm he grew up on, he gave me these stones that used to connect together. They were from like a little... Huh? Little outcropping there on the farm he grew up in. And it had all these little embedded fossils on there. And they were, there was like hundreds of them all tightly packed together. What that means is that all of those creatures died in the same place at the same time. And normally, that's what you see. When you see, when they find fossil beds, they find large amounts of fossils all in the same place, all buried at the same time, squished by billions and billions and billions and trillions of gallons, of, tons of water mashing down on them, basically cementing them in a matter of days. That's what happened. Billions of dead things, all in the same happy place. They all died at once. All right? So the seed that went on the ark is the same seed that came off of the ark and God was able to preserve it. So this, the, the puppy dogs and the kitty cats and the hamburgers. Well, you don't eat puppy dogs and kitty cats. But the hamburgers that you eat now were the same hamburgers that they ate before the flood. Same cows. Same type. Does that make sense to everybody? 
They were the ones that Noah saved were not genetically modified yet. <laughs> okay, they didn't get to them. Uh, look in um, Genesis three. Turn there, and I'm going to show you the purpose of why I think the devil wanted to corrupt the seed. Okay, Genesis three. And when we, before we read this, let me preface it this way. Who in here has heard or read of stories of three parent children? Three parent children. Know what that is? Britain's doing it. Great Britain, several years ago, they decided that they were going to go forward and they knew that they had to change a lot of laws for this. But the British scientists knew that they had a way now of taking a, an embryo, a child in an embryo state, and if that child had some sort of deficiency in its DNA, they would take donor DNA from a third party, take from their DNA what the deficiency was in that child and insert it into that child's DNA, so when that child is born, he has three parents that have donated their DNA to make this one human being. See, I'm getting little doodads back here just thinking because that is like beyond Frankenstein creepy. My birth certificate doesn't have a place on it for the third parent. You see what I'm saying? All these genealogies in the Bible, you see them from, that's how it's been throughout history. Now we're altering the course of history. Because parent, children that have three parents can have four parents. Why not five parents? Why not six parents? Why can't somebody dig up Howard Hughes, extract some of his DNA, inserted into their unborn child so that their child is the heir to Howard Hughes's fortune because he has Howard Hughes's DNA. Okay? Rock stars get sued all the time by people because they say, uh, my mama said that she was with you. And here I am, and I look like you, and I want your money. Bill Clinton has got a biracial kid around that swears that Bill Clinton's his daddy, and he looks like Bill Clinton. And he is suing now to get a DNA test done so that it can be proven that he is Bill Clinton's illegitimate son. So why can't I have a child that has Howard Hughes DNA so that my kid can collect payment money from Howard Hughes' estate and get rich and I can live off of it. Okay? It's bizarre, but we're in that day right now. Okay? We now have the ability to corrupt seed. Think about this. Two married men married to each other that want to have a baby that is the exclusive child of those two men. Is it possible? In the world we live in right now, it is possible. I want you to read your Bible. Genesis 3, 14. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. You ever seen a snake going around? What are they doing? The tongue is constantly going out, sampling what's in front of it, and it's always picking up dust. Always. In fact, how, is, how does a serpent smell? With his tongue. He's sampling the dirt and the odors that are around him and putting them in his mouth. This Bible's right. Okay? Nomadic tent dwellers 5,000 years ago did not know that about snakes. God did. Okay? I will, so verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. 
Now here's the biggie. If a child then is born as the product of two men, he is not the seed of a woman. Dun, dun, dun. And the prophecy then is busted, cannot be fulfilled. So I want you to think about why the devil would want to corrupt everybody's DNA. Because the fulfillment of prophecy is what this Bible is all about. Remember, God himself said, if the prophet is wrong one time, you don't have to listen to him. God, God made it so that every prophecy in here has to be fulfilled. And the devil knows it. So he is set about to make sure that one particular prophecy is not fulfilled. And that is the seed of the woman prophecy. And according to what I can see, if we go back to Genesis, and I'm going to let you go after this. According to what I see, in Genesis uh, 6.12, all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. He came within eight people of accomplishing his goal. Eight people were allowed to go on the ark. Other than those eight people, it looks to me like every other human being had been corrupted in their generation. He came very close to fulfilling what he set out to do, and that is corrupt the seed. Does the devil corrupt seed? Sure he does. Most of the churches in this town read out of it every Sunday. Corrupt seed. So the Bible scholars have taught the doctors how to do this. Just, just change. If you don't like it, just change it. Because that's what we do. We see something in our Bible. We don't like it. We don't agree with it. We just rewrite it and change it and say that's the way it was originally. And so now I've read some books. I'm going to be done. I've read some books where, and I've heard some, some of these people talk that, that are for changing man's DNA. And they said, now that we know how to do it, it would be wrong if we didn't do it. If now that we know how to rewrite DNA and take away man's disease, it would be immoral not to do it. You see what they're doing? They're taking that which God said was wrong and they're making it right. And those of us who aren't going along with it, we're going to be wrong when God said it was right. Amen? That's the world. That is the freaky, creepy, out of our minds world that we live in. I'm telling you, everything in this world is going to change. Just like it was in the days of Noah. And we're living in those days, people. Get your hammers out. Start cutting some trees down. Well, the ark is already ready. The ark is Jesus. Amen? Stand up. I heard you up there, Johnny. Mm -mm -mm. Study... Matthew 13. Okay? Study Matthew 13 this week. By the way, look up on the screen. See where all those little purple markers are? Those purple markers represent every place in the United States where giant skeletons were found by our ancestors in caves in burial sites in mounds all newspaper reportings newspaper clippings going back to the 1800s because as man started moving westward they would build towns and they would start exploring the areas around them they would find caves they would go in these caves and they would find leg bones that were this long and they would write about them in the local newspaper. 
and then send them to the Smithsonian Institute where they just disappeared. But those markers up there is every place where giant skeleton bones were found from the giants. I believe it! Because I believe the Bible. Amen? Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this Bible. It's right. It's warning us. It's telling us of things that are coming. Lord, help us to study more. Help us to read more. Help us to read with a purpose. Lord, let it be in all of our hearts, God, that we want to know this Bible. You promised that the very elect would not be deceived by what's coming in these last days. So, Father, lead each one of us into a place, Lord, in our Bible. Give us knowledge. Give us instruction. And Father, just take verses and just plant them in our minds, in our hearts somewhere. And Father, when the, when the day gets here, when the day of deception gets here, the Holy Ghost will pull those verses out and we'll know why we knew that. And we'll know not to be deceived by what's being told of us. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us. Open our eyes. Father, if there's anything, anything that I said tonight that was out of line with your word, God, correct me and correct it in the hearts of these that heard it tonight. Bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.